<clears throat> Shalom, everybody. I'm really uh, excited about this class, um, and I wanted to start it with uh, acknowledging that one of the things I really like about Judy Klitzner's book, um, and I confess completely that m almost all of what I'm teaching is really drawn from her book. In our tradition, that's not an insult to me. Um, it's only an insult to me if I pretend it's my own. Mm -hmm. But to cite something in the name of the person who said it, right? That's like saying Rabbi Shimon Omer, or, you know, like R Rabbi Shimon said, and then quoting in Pirkei Avot, right? We, that's what we do is we, we derive from the scholarship of previous generations, and then we uh, transform it in our own spirit and mind and transmit it to the next generation. So um, I'm so grateful to uh, Klitzner for what she did because my experience is, oh my God, I can't believe I never saw that before. Every single chapter of the book is like that. I must, you know, I don't know, I'm not bragging because I'm no different than any other shul person who hears and reads the Bible or any other rabbi who's a Bible scholar of sorts. You know, I've read the Bible, the Torah, at least a lot of times. And then it's not till I read her book that I'm like, oh, my God, there's two non-Jewish priests who totally changed the direction of the story. But I never had that bird's eye view before. Never put these two stories together in a way that sees them not only as part of a larger, but as a polemic where two stories serve a polemical, dialectical role with each other. And I, you know, just these aha experiences of learning. And it's exciting to me because, you know, sometimes uh, if you study the same thing over and over again, it can get a little dry. If you're not careful, uh, you can uh, get shallow as opposed to deep. And so I appreciate a book like this that offers new perspective because it helps me to get deeper in. Um, so uh, the third chapter of her book, as I said, deals with these two <clears throat> non-Israelite priests, uh, Melchizedek, um, the uh, priest of El Elyon, whatever that means, of God the Most High, and uh, Yitro, Jethro, the Kohen of Midian, the priest of Midian. Uh, I just want to say, like, uh, these two figures are introduced as if the reader would know who they are. We, modern Jews, may not be familiar with what it meant to be the Kohen of, of Midian, but the ancient reader, or at least the writer, assumed that their readers... Uh, knew who that was. There's no footnote that says, by the way, the Kohen of Midian is in charge of A, B, C, D, and E. So these were, it, uh, we can conclude that they were powerful and well-known people, people who don't need an introduction. Um, the Secretary of State. I mean, if you're a U.S. citizen, you know what that means. So, um, uh, I love the connection between these two stories, and I, and I love what she has done with it as two models of leadership uh, and of guidance for leadership that are given when the circumstances and the needs of the time called for two different models of leader. And for the first of uh, so far, uh, she's going to really claim that these stories don't so much undermine or subvert each other as that they pose a, a, a converse of the coin, a flip side, a dialectic, uh, one to the other. Two different styles that may both be positive. Previously, we looked at there's a bad model, and then this other one sort of corrects the bad model of behavior. Here, it's not that there's a bad model of behavior, it's that Sometimes you need one and sometimes you need the other. 
and that they are they are very very different. So let's uh, jump in. I want to give you just quickly what she says are the 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 obvious. Once you know them, once you've read this, you're like, oh, it's obvious that they're connected. Uh, the connections. Um, uh, Melchizedek and uh, Yitro both appear at critical moments in the story. Just like when we studied objects, we noticed that when they come into the story is crucial. Um, when the patriarch is weary, both of them offer lechem, bread. Um, they both offer bracha, some form of the word barech, blessing. Um, they both encourage the patriarch to see God's hand. They reference somehow the hand, which symbolizes God's action, providence, uh, direction within the world. Um, uh, and um, both highlight somehow tzedek, God's righteousness, as the what Klitzner is going to claim is the ultimate theme of the Hebrew Bible is righteousness. Okay, now the similar the similarities, but I'm going to read you just a little bit directly from Klitzner to introduce. <clears throat> uh, the similarities between these two priests will propel us toward a broader comparison of the patriarchs. We're not just going to compare Melchizedek and Yitro, we're going to compare Avraham and Moshe. Because that's what we're really, you know, we're, we're finding that these are people who help our leaders, but that the two leaders are very, very different. And though they are arguably the most uh, important figures in the whole chronicle of the emerging nation, both will need this outside counsel in order to face and meet the challenges of their leadership. But she says, once we've noticed the similarities between the two narratives, we'll observe their differences and we'll sharpen our lens, noticing the two stories present two separate leadership models. Abraham, she's claiming, is the tale of an iconoclast, someone who needs to break away from the general population and be kind of a loner, <clears throat> to separate himself, to resist external pressures, and to focus on internal truths. Whereas Moshe, guided by primarily the women in his life and the modeling which he has seen, struggles between not belonging in one population and not belonging in the other, and struggles to be a man, to know what it means to be connected to a community. And even though he runs away into the desert, his um, actual leadership will require him to be a part of the community, to join together, and to have a community-based, more inclusive model of leadership than Avraham. Okay, now, <clears throat> let's jump right into the text. The, the, the texts today are, uh, some of them are just texts that I think we just don't pay that much attention to because, um, and we don't understand the role they play in the in the larger text of the Torah. Um, and we see them as kind of historical texts that aren't about the family life. But I think they're really fun and interesting texts, and we're going to spend a little time with them. All right. Um, uh, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, God says to Abraham, Lech lecha, go, go to yourself. Uh, is, is there any sentence that is more iconoclastic and about leaving and going away from community than go unto yourself, become a loner, go from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's home. In other words, leave all of the cultures that you know. Any anything that might be a bad influence on you. And if you do that, I will make of you a great nation. 
I will bless you. There's that word bracha. And I will make great gadol shemecha veheye bracha. And you will be a bracha veavarcha mevarechecha. I will bless those who bless you. And not only that, but the nations of the earth v'nivrichu v'cha. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves. Bless, 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 bless. Five blessings in two verses. We've been students together now enough that you know that that's not nothing. <laughs> We're supposed to take notice of that. Avraham's blessings are contingent upon his leaving. And going on his own, away from his family and everything he knows. Now, Abraham, of course, does this, right? And he goes and he settles in Beersheba. We know that he, there's a story, he goes all the way up to Turkey, and then he goes all the way down to the tip of the Negev Desert. Now, um, uh, in between that, uh, uh, 12 and 14, is his arrival in the land of Eretz Israel, in the land of Canaan. Um, and then one of the very first things that happens to him is this story. And I don't know about you, but is anybody really, really familiar with this story of the battle of the kings against the battle of the kings. It's one of those stories that you kind of glaze over for. Oh, I'm sorry. It's heretical. No, it's not heretical. It's true. I mean, it's just a very real thing, right? Like, don't, don't be embarrassed about stuff like that. This is how we learn. I, I do that also because I'm like, I see all these names. I'm Raphael, Khedar La Omer. Shemever. All right, forget it. I don't you know, right? It all starts to, it seems like jargon, but it's not. It is this, there's a story underneath it. So we're going to get to the story underneath it. And then when some future rabbi asks you, who's familiar with the story, you'll say, I am. <laughs> we'll all raise our hand. Okay. Now, when uh, King Amraphel of Shinar, King Arioch, King Chedar Omer, and King Tidal. Okay, so those are four kings. They make an alliance. And they made war on other kings. King Bera, he's going to be important. The king of Sodom, don't forget him. King Birsha, by the way, Bera means in, in wickedness, Bera, with evil. Birasha, Rasha, the word Rasha, Ra and Rasha. Sodom, Amora. You hear already hints of the story of Sodom and Amora, Sodom and Gomorrah, and their destruction. Abraham is going to play a role in that story. So we're being, these, this is foreshadowing. This war is not about these kings, it's about Avraham. So we have King Bera, King Birsha, King Shinav, Shem Ever, Bela, uh, and, and the king of Bela, which is Soa. All of the latter joined forces in the Valley of Sidim, now the Dead Sea. So this is down in the Negev Desert, in the Dead Sea Desert. So 12 years they served Chedar Laomer. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. And in the 14th year, Chedar Laomer and the kings who were with him came and scored a victory against all these different groups the Rifaim, Zuzim, and blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, okay, now we get to the important thing. On their way back, they uh, came to Ein Mishpat, they subdued the territories there. Then the king of Sodom, remember him, Bera, and the king of 
Amora and his crew, they engaged them in battle. Four kings against those five. So this is a long time military and political conflict between tribes and clans in two principal alliances, four kings against five kings. And just like modern um, alliances, this is proving out in the news even today uh, in, in, uh, in, in NATO, when one nation is attacked, being in the pact means you go, you spend your money and put your people at risk in order to help the other people in the alliance. That's what Abraham is going to be called on to do. <clears throat> He's going to be asked to play a role in this ongoing conflict and to choose a side to make a pact which will obligate him into this larger conflict. Okay, the invaders seized all the wealth and all the provisions that went their way. And they also took Lot, who is Avraham's nephew. Aha, this is Avraham's connection. You don't have to know all about those names. All of that first part can be summarized to say there is a battle between four kings in alliance and five kings in alliance. And one side takes Abraham's nephew and all of his crew, right? His people and his stuff. Mm -hmm. Because Lot had settled in Sodom. And Sodom was invaded and their wealth was seized. So Lot's stuff was seized. And a fugitive brought this news to Abraham, who was dwelling over there. He was, you know, with these other people, not really um, allied with the three and the four and the five, but he had his own allies. He dwelled in Mamre, uh, 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 the Terebus of Mamre, with his kinsmen, Eshkol and Aner, being Abraham's allies. So picture this story. You're Abraham, a guy who is escaped as a fugitive from being taken prisoner. So he's in tattered clothes, he's exhausted, he's hungry. He comes, <gasps> the others, they took Lot and they fled to the north with him and his whole family. When Abraham heard his kinsmen had been taken captive, he, what did he do? I love this. Without hesitation, Abraham mustered his retainers. He puts out word, he says, Get your swords, everybody. You, if, you're, if you're under my protection and you're in my household and you're benefiting from my wealth, you are now part of my militia. Born into his household, numbering 318. That's a very specific number, isn't it? I like that number because it makes me think that's probably an accurate number somehow, right? Like, Somebody got a, num a very important, like it seemed important to them to say 308, not just 300. Avraham took a militia of over 300 men to go chase after the brigade of these kings who had captured his nephew. This is a rescue mission. And they went as far as Dan. Anybody familiar with Israeli geography? Don is all the way north. The north. It's essentially the border of what is today Lebanon. You can go to Tel Dan. There's a spring up there. It's the source of the Dan River, which is one of the uh, sources of the Jordan River. But it's all the way up north. So Abraham is down at the Dead Sea. He musters 300 men and they chase all the way up. At night, he and his servants deployed against them and defeated them and he defeated and he pushed them even farther north into Damascus. That's in Syria, even further north. He brought back all the possessions. 
he brought back all his kinsmen, Lot and his possessions and the women and the rest of the people. And when he returned um, from defeating, uh, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him. Um, pause. What do you expect to happen? Barbara. I'm not ready to answer your question, but I'm just impressed okay. by the distance. How much time did this take? Right. Um, that's, you know, I don't know whether pushing them to Damascus means he ended up pushing them and went as far as Damascus himself. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty long distance. So this yes. took place yes. over time after time, days after days after months, et cetera. Correct. How fast they, they going? It, it's, it, it's an, it is a military mission, right? They are moving as an armed force. So they're traveling up the Jordan River Valley all the way up to Don, which is not an easy trip from the Dead Sea, but it's also not months, right? You can traverse the length of, of the land of Canaan by foot in weeks, let's say. But it's not a short trip either, you're right. And you're moving 300 soldiers, which means food, it means caravans, it means tents, it means provisions, it means arms, it means armorers, it means people, cooks, everything, quartermasters, right? I mean, he has a 300 person militia. This is a unit, this is a brigade. He's, this, he's not messing around and pushing them to Syria means he defeated them and then he kicked their tail another 50 miles. Distance and time had a different meaning those days. Yeah, that's right. Um, they didn't expect things to happen in a matter of a couple of days and to cross the globe and to traverse things in iron horses. They, by the, so it also means, you know, the people who seized Lot, they may have had some time advantage, but they also had to travel by the same means. You know, they didn't magically uh, jet up to Don. But so now, um, uh, yes, yeah, Cindy. I find it interesting that here Abraham saves Lot a first time where we know he's going to save him again. Doesn't he save with the Sodom and Gomorrah story? Yes, that's correct. Um, it's, it's good to have Uncle Abraham. <laughs> right, like it's, yeah, to bail you out. <laughs> that's right. Abraham is a seriously connected man, <laughs> right? And Lot is is sort of not like Lot is under the protection of Sodom of Sodom, and so when Abraham is coming back, he's not just coming back with Lot, his nephew. He's coming back with Lot and Lot's people, right? All he's coming back with a large group and a lot of wealth that was seized which belongs to an alliance with the king of Sodom, right? Abraham is acting as an agent of the king of Sodom because he is attacking his, Bera's enemy. And so he's not unallied for the moment with the king of Sodom. And he has been successful. So when he comes back, what does it mean when the king comes out to greet you? It means there's going to be a conversation, an exchange. You're going to get something, right? Think of that scene in The Godfather where it's a, his, uh, the, the birthday party or the wedding, right? And all these people doing nice things for the Godfather. Yeah, perhaps someday you can do something nice for me. Um, yeah, right. Okay. Abraham goes. He goes on this incredibly difficult, long, expensive journey. The king is coming out to greet him. We, hmm. the reader, assume what is going to happen. They are. So Bera is going to say, Thank you, Abraham. Here is a thousand sheep and a hundred goats and ten gallons of silver. Something, right? Something like that. But what actually happens? Nothing. We completely switch gears to a completely other story in which this 
unknown character, Melchit Tzedek, shows up and does something completely out of the storyline. It's a crucial moment. Avraham must be tired, wounded, exhausted of resource and of energy, um, worried about his own family and about what the implications of his alliance with Sodom are going to be. Does he or does he not now accept the largesse of Sodom or not? Right? There's a lot at stake here. This is a crucial moment. He's just getting started with this whole mission anyways. And we all know Bera, King Wicked, that's literally his name, is not a good guy. Sodom and Amora are going to be destroyed for their wickedness. You don't want to be allied with them. So in the middle of this, um, in the middle of this shows up Melchizedek. I want to also go into the Hebrew here for a second. Umelchitzedek, see his name, Melech, Melchi, and Tzedek, his name is literally righteousness. Melchi means Melech, king. He's the king of righteousness. That's his name. I'm king righteous, as opposed to Melech Bera. Right? I mean, this is very Faustian, right? There's, there's a good guy here, and there's a bad guy. And Melchitzedek, King good guy is the good guy and king bad guy is the bad guy in case you couldn't tell by their names. He was Melech um, Shalem. Hotzi Lechem Vayayin. He brings out bread and wine. He, he just feeds Avraham. Avraham is coming back from war and the first thing he does is he feeds him. And this is the only instance in the whole Bible where someone is both a king and a priest. That's very interesting for other reasons, but just make mention of it here. Vehu Kohen, he was also the priest to El Elyon. Uh, El is one of the names for God, God. Um, El Elyon is, uh, Elyon means up high, God, the Elyon, the highest high. God most high is usually how it's, it's translated. And this is Vayivarchehu. And he doesn't ask him for anything. He doesn't give it, and, and, and he blesses him. He says, Baruch Avram Le'el Elyon. Praised be Avram to God the Most High, Kone Shemaim Baaretz, who the, the ruler of the whole of the universe, of sky and, and of earth. Ubaruch El Elyon, and praise be El Elyon, Asher Migen, who protected you, delivered your foes into your hand. There's that word Magen. We even say that in our daily brachot. Praise are you, Adonai, Magen Avraham. That is an idea whose origin comes from Melchizedek. This is not a small moment. Melchizedek is reminding him, hey, that military victory you just won, don't forget. El Elyon was your shield against your enemy or your foe in your hand, the hand. And what does Abraham do? He gives him a tenth of everything. Abraham is coming back with this wealth. Remember, the future of that wealth is uncertain. And as soon as Melchizedek shows up and reminds him of God and God's role in his life and feeds him bread and wine and blesses him and reminds him of God's blessing, Avram gives him 10%. And then Melchizedek disappears. And we rejoin our incident with the king of Sodom. 
that's really kind of crazy, right? You see that. It's this, what, for three, four, five verses? At this crucial venture, a mysterious stranger shows up. Not, I mean, he's not a stranger. He's, he's a well-known person, but he, he's strange to the story. He refocuses Avram's energy. And Avraham gives him a, a tremendous reward for this. 10% of the booty has got to be a you know, substantial amount. <clears throat> then the king of Sodom comes. And I, I, I love this. this. This is a great example of um, uh, Klitzner asks, did the did Melchizedek's intervention work? We're worried that Abraham is going to lose focus. He's going to get into an alliance with an earthly king. He's going to be just another guy who's part of King Bera's, you know, crew of influential people. He's going to forget righteousness and blessing and El Elyon. And, and he, he's... He needs to not do those things. He needs to stay out of those alliances. <clears throat> and that kind of means he has to refuse the money. Uh, you, can't, you can't sleep. You sleep with dogs, you get fleas. Right? If you get paid by the king of Sodom, you belong to the king of Sodom. So then now uh, the king comes out to greet him. This interstitial happens, and then we hear what the king of Sodom is going to say to him. The king of Sodom says, Tenli Hanefesh, give me the life, the flesh, the people, and you keep the booty, the possessions, the material wealth for yourself. That's quite a deal. You can keep all the money for your wear and tear and your effort. All of it. All I want is the people. Now we, the reader who've read through the story, we know what the, you know, what Sodom and Amorah think the value of people is. Avraham is like, hmm, big pile of money my stupid nephew Lot. That's his choice. It's a classic choice. It's not an easy choice, right? Because Lot is, we don't like Lot. He's, he's, he is the, you know, pain in the butt nephew. Big pile of money and connection, political influence, right? All that goes with being an ally. And here's what Abraham says. In case we were wondering whether Melchizedek had an impact on him, he says, I swear to God El Elyon, which Avram does not, you know, that is, that's not like the common way Avram refers to God. Creator of heaven and earth, exactly as Melchizedek said to him. He's become a disciple. He was impacted strongly by Melchizedek. He's using his language. And then he says, I won't even take so much as a thread or a shoelace of what is yours. Because I won't let you say, I made Avraham rich. Ani isharti. I gave him a tithe. Right? I won't let you say that. Melchizedek can say, Avraham made me rich, but I won't let you say that. I made Avraham rich. <clears throat> and then he says, I will take nothing but what my servants have used. And as for the share of my men who went with me, they take their share. In other words, you will pay for my food and my travel. But other than that, I won't take even one shoelace from you. It's brilliant. Words, I'll make you pay for what you did for me. 
It's a very strong, it's powerful negotiating. And of course, the very next thing that happens, we won't read through this whole thing, is Abraham has a life-changing vision of God, a completely mysterious and terrifying one, which is the source of his eternal blessing and of all the generations, and in which he is given the reward of the all of the land. So shall your offspring, this land shall belong to them. And it's sealed with this mysterious uh, um, uh, covenant between the pieces. And of course, blessing, 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 blessings, blessings. You will all be blessed and blessed and blessed. And the land, this land shall be assigned to you. And here, all the names of the people who were defeated, the Rifaim and the Amorim and the Canaanites, these are the people who delivered their land that will belong to you, says God. So what do we think? Was Melchizedek crucial at this vital role? Avraham, er, you know, sometimes early in, in a person's journey towards greatness, they get distracted and they never become great. You have to be on the road a little while and Avraham is going to have to be alone longer. His, his story is defined by leaving people. He, leave, he literally leaves almost everybody in his whole family over the course of his life. His leadership will be to clarify the eternal, internal truth that God is one, that he made a covenant with the family of Abraham, that he is a God of righteousness and tzedek, not a God of might and power and blood and, you know, coin. And that he promised in covenant the land of Israel to Abraham and his descendants. That is going to be, because Abraham is not actually the leader of a nation yet. This is Klitzner's uh, uh, transitional point. He's the leader of a potential nation. He's a, a thought leader is what we'd call him today. He's got to get away from the chatter and the noise and the common and the accepted rhetoric and develop a, a, a different one. All right, questions up to there, anything, comments, questions, reactions, responses? Do leaders have to be, um, uh, alone a little bit? Is there, a, what aspect of leadership requires that you not be a part of the hoi polloi, the everyday people? Can officers fraternize with the infantry? Or in order to lead, do you somehow have to be separate and apart from the, the normal culture of the place? Yeah, Mickey. I'm not answering the response to that okay. question. That, that, that's fine. Those were just prompts. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, uh, I've never really heard much about Malkadesic. Yeah. Uh, but were he and Yitro both not Jewish? Uh, yes, that's right. I mean, in Avraham's day, uh, Jewish isn't really the right um, moniker uh, because Jewish comes from Judah. Judah hasn't been born yet. You know, Judah is. Um, but we would say, you know, uh, uh, B'nai Avraham, the children of Abraham, or, or at least, you know, the Israelites. He's, he's non-Israelite. Okay. Um, yeah. So Melchie, how, right. how, yeah, do no, the, yeah. how do these two men know about our God? Well, so um, uh, Klitzner poses the, the, the important point that, um, and I, I agree with this personally, and I think it's a major, major error in modern Jewish thinking. 
that we somehow have something that nobody else could possibly have. <laughs> what a mistake to think that there is not um, a path altering wisdom amongst the nations. That's a mistake. And it's and and if there is a message to these two stories, it is smart Jewish leaders listen to the profound universalist leaders of other people who know what the heck they're talking about and whose wisdom is apparent and don't apologize for it. Then they actually integrate that wisdom and use it in their speech. I'll give you a personal example, Mickey, because I really believe this. I, really, I, I have grown less particular and more universal. There's a part of me that longs to be beyond religion completely. Um, I still like religion, that's the thing, right? I, I do. Um, I, I, I remember very clearly as a seminary student learning and watching Christian seminary students pray on demand, which we as, as Jews, we don't do that. We pray out of a book and we have, you know, a liturgy that is prescribed for us. So when someone says, hey, it's time to pray, you say, you know, you recite Psalm 145, right? Ashray, Ashray. You don't have to come up and make up your own prayer. When you want to pray before bedtime, you don't have to come up with a prayer for what you, you know, want God to do overnight. You say the Shema. Right? It's, very, it's, it's prescribed and it's kind of, there's something valuable to that. But the Christians, they just make it up on the spot. And they have a, a treasury of vocabulary that they draw from. They're, they're not unpracticed and it's not magic what they do. You know, they're not like channeling something. They have a, a cache of vocabulary that applies to prayer life and that you can draw from in the moment of inspiration to help you pray in English. They talk about stuff like um, uh, give us strength, give us what we want God to give us. They talk about redemption and salvation and, and um, you know, direction of heart and of spirit. They talk about protection of family and health. They talk about make us a part, you know, enlighten us. Right? I mean, there's, okay, it's not that hard. You can learn it. And I started to do it and I like it. It changed my religious life. People started to ask me to pray for them. And I did right on the spot. I had a guy replace my sink <clears throat> that long ago he came in they, they did this great job where they do it all in place and cut everything in place and do the old thing and um, he found out it was a rabbi and they're a new business he was like rabbi would you pray for my business and i told him i would and i prayed right then and there and i tried to be as christian as i could about it <laughs> yeah because that was what the moment called for it called for the wisdom of what i had learned from non-jewish leaders who showed me another way to reach, you know, El Elyon. I don't think that's crazy. I, I think it happens. Thank well, you. Rabbi, most um, leaders, uh, the common leaders will tell you that leadership is a lonely place to be. So that there, there is some distance, uh, physical, emotional distance between the usual leader and uh, people who are he is leading. But the, the classic to me leader, thought leader, uh, was Gandhi because uh, he had no army. He had no power other than the power of his thoughts. And uh, of course, Martin Luther King, I think, used his thoughts in a you know, non, nonviolent resistance in a big way. So that I think similar to what you're saying, it's important for uh, people to learn from others in different religions or other backgrounds, utilize it, especially in a powerful, thought-provoking way. Um, I think um, I, I think anybody who has been a leader can relate to the loneliness that's there. Um, it really, and uh, we could talk for a long time about why that is. Why a leader can't be like everybody else, um, and and why. Um, the two in some ways are not compatible. Um, uh, at the same time, um, 
Uh, I think your two examples are, are good examples of people who um, were not out of touch. They were, um, uh, King especially, I think, utilize what we will see as Yitro's, Jethro's advice of, you know, a, a systematic organization, the whole um, uh, Students for Nonviolent, um, you know, et cetera. I mean, they, they were a very well-organized group. Um, at least they were trying to be, you know, I mean, they, um, so it wasn't you know like, that. hey, here's this guy and he's out in Nowheresville and you know, up alone on the top of the mountain, right? You know, no, he's in meetings with organizing people and getting them to do, you know, the the, the ground level work. Um, Gandhi too, in other words, they, they were not, but they both spent time alone. Important formative thought time, separated from people in, in moments of hardship usually, actually, not like in spa, luxuriating alone time, you know, on the mountaintop, but in prison or starving, you know, barefoot, poverty, in poverty. I mean, they, they spent hard time alone and count re-encountering the thing that moved them. And that I think, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna let you go. And then I wanna use that as the transition to Moshe. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this may be slightly off the track, but I just wanted you to know that one of the most interesting observations I made of Rabbi Jonathan Miller while he was here in Birmingham mm -hmm. was he was particularly engaged with the communities around him, black, white, Christian, white, Muslim, whatever. But he said, you know, all of the, I really envy those guys who can just stand up and pray just exactly what you just said. He had that same feeling, but then with a little twinkle in his eyes, he would say, but you know what they say to me? He didn't. He said, we wish we could do a funeral like you do. <laughs> and Miller would say, yes, I'm very good at funerals. <laughs> And he was. His eulogies were, were wonderful. I'm glad he put them in a book. Funny. That is funny. Yeah. Ella, I see you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to say that, um, you know, there are many people who have had just a comment made by somebody who isn't necessarily a leader that has changed their lives. I mean, I know of a girl who was eight years old and somebody said to her, my goodness, you're such an artist after seeing some typical eight-year-old picture. Well, that woman now has a scholarship. The, the little girl now has a scholarship to one of the fine art schools in this country. And she said, that's because this woman called me an artist. Yeah, um, I, uh, I think you are so right. It's, and it is often a person um, who we encounter at a young age at a, a, again, a liminal moment. I think it, we, it, it's what matters is when we encounter them. We encounter them in a moment where our, our direction, our path, our truth, our unfolding is in jeopardy. And they remind us of what we really are and of what our real motivation is. I, um, if if I if I remember to I'll 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 at the end I'll send you all a link of a, a video I love that I have to search for for a second about a, an artist talking about Miss Harris his kindergarten teacher art teacher who who like pretended that you drew the best pumpkin that anybody had ever drawn in the history of a, you know pumpkins being drawn and that like inspired him that somebody had that wherewithal to say to him. Your pumpkin is amazing. Everybody drew a pumpkin, you know, in kindergarten, but yours is amazing. So, um, okay. Um, we're gonna see that, you know, Yitro really does play that role in a sense in, in Moshe's life and that he is lost. That uh, one of the things about Moshe is he is lonely. He doesn't fit in. Um, uh, I wanna just uh, quickly look at the early you know, uh, how Klitzner sets the stage for us to think about Moshe. There was a man of the house of Levi. Uh, he married and conceived and bore a son and she saw how beautiful he was, she hid him. 
and she could hide him no longer. She put the child into the Nile in the basket and his sister was there. You know the story. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the Nile. She spied the basket. What Klitster points out here is the repetition of the word to see. She saw, she saw, she saw, she saw. Over and over and over again. And the repetition of the word yell at, boy, child. Moshe is a child. He's a boy. But whose child? That's the thing. He doesn't know whose child he is. And if you don't know whose child you are, um, it's going to be hard for you to know what kind of man you are or what kind of woman you are. Um, we define ourselves by knowing where we fit in and where we don't. Um, sometime after Moshe had grown, he went out to his kinfolk. We don't exactly know who that is. Is that the Egyptians? Is that the Israelites? And he saw their labors. He saw an Egyptian man. And here she points out not the word yeled, but the word ish. Ish mitri. Ish ein ish. Shnei anashim. Uh, le ish. Ish, ish. Over and over again. Multiple, multiple times the word man. Mensch. Not just, you know, biological human. But it means... Um, a mensch. Sometime after that, when Moshe had grown, he went out, he witnessed, and you, you know this story too, probably. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. One of his kinsmen. He turned this way and that. But he didn't see Vayar. And he saw Ki ain't Ish. He saw that there was no Ish. That's such a powerful line. All of the women who raised him, um, they all were Vayar. They saw things. What is he seeing? Is he seeing that there are no other people around or is he seeing that there is no one who will stand up and be a man? A moral voice. That's what I mean. I don't mean be a man like some tough macho thing. And what he does, vayach, he hits. Moshe is impetuous. He doesn't have a great role model. Boys who grow to be men, this story is suggesting, without a great role model, without knowing who they are and what they belong to, will be impetuous. This turns out to be a very bad decision, even if guided by a moral judgment. So bad, in fact, that he hides it. He buries him in the sand. He knows right away that he is, uh-oh. By the way, can you think of another time when Moshe hits something impetuously in a moment that turns out to have really bad consequences for him. Wow. Yeah, in fact, uh, consequences that mean he will not get to enter into the land of Israel. Hitting the rock. That's right. It's the same thing. Vayach. He does the same thing impetuously, and so he goes out on the second day. You know, two days later, and he sees two Hebrew people fighting. So he says, why are you hitting one another? Take, here's that word, hit. Why are you hitting your friend? And what did they say? Like, you know, nobody appreciates a Budinsky, right? They say, who made you? Ish, Sar, Alenu. Who made you? Le'ish. Sar v'shofet aleinu. 
as ruler and judge over us. Oh, are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? And Moshe realizes that he was not alone. There were witnesses. And he, what he is worried about is it comes true by Ishma Paro. Pharaoh hears about it. And he is mad. And he sought to kill Moses. And Moses flees Pharaoh and he flees out to the desert to be alone. And he goes to Midian and he sits down where a lot of these stories unfold. He sits at the well. Um, at this stage, is Moshe even a leader? Not really. He's, he's a prince, kind of, though Pharaoh turns on him pretty quickly just for killing one person. Um, but he killed an Egyptian. And Pharaoh probably does know Moses's origins at this point. We, we got to assume Pharaoh's not dumb. He at least knows he was adopted or found, if not Hebrew. Okay, now, here we go. The priest of Midian, Kohen Midian, had seven daughters. Don't they always have seven daughters, right? It's a musical about that. Um, and they, you know, Moshe is at the well, and then his daughters come to the well. Um, remember, Moshe is driven by women. His whole narrative is propelled forward by women. So that these women show up there is not incidental. They come to draw water and fill the troughs and they water their father's flock and the shepherds came, but shepherds came. That, that's a bad thing, right? Shepherds coming, they, they came to hassle the women uh, and drove them off. And Moshe, who sees this, because of course Moses is the guy who jumps in impetuously to help somebody. He's like, hey, and he jumps up with his stick and he runs off, you know, jumps to their defense and he waters their flock. And when they returned to their father, Reuel, that's another one of his names, he said, how is it that you've come back so soon? And they said, an Egyptian man, Ish Mitzri, rescued us from the shepherd. He even drew water and he said, where is he? Why did you leave this man? Ask him to break bread with us. First thing he does at this crucial point is he offers him bread. And um, uh, Moses consented by Yoel Moshe to stay with the man. Now Moshe finally in his life has a male role model who is a good one for him. And he agrees and stays with him there. And as a result, he has given Zipporah as a wife. Very nice. She bears a son who is named Gershom which means stranger, because I was born a stranger in a strange land. Okay. Any questions up to there? Um, this is the moment, of course, after which God hears the Israelites groaning under bondage and sends Moshe back to be with them. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father and all, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel and how God had sought them out from Egypt. So he took them and her two sons, one who was named Gershom and the other was named Eliezer, meaning God has been my help. And uh, he delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. This is after they've left Egypt now. Again, in a moment of battle and of physical jeopardy. Yitro, Moses' father-in-law, brings Moses' son and wife with him into the wilderness where they encamp at the mountain. And he said, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons. You're not going to leave your family. Unlike Avraham, who leaves his wife and his family, 
Yitro brings Moshe, his wife and family, reminds him, you are first and foremost a family man. Moshe goes out to greet him. He bows low. They ask about each other. Moshe then recounted to his father-in-law everything that has happened, all the hardships that had befallen, all the plagues, et cetera, et cetera. Then he says, blessed be God who delivered you. Remember, Asher Migain, who delivered you? He reminds him of God. He reminds him that God delivered him and who delivered you from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that God is greater than all the other gods. Um, uh, uh, by the result of their very schemes against the people. And Jethro brings a burnt offering, just like in the other story, where there is an immediately a burnt offering to focus back his intentions. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and Aaron come with all the elders to partake. Next day, Moses sits in judgment. But when Moses' father-in-law saw what he was doing, being all alone, he says, this is not good for you. You'll never succeed all alone. You need to make a system. He tells him how to do this whole system, get trustworthy people, set over them as chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Make an orderly system. Create a community. Rely on others. Stop running away. Make it easier for yourself to share the burden. Because, of course, Moses is going to be the leader of an actual nation that requires not just vision, but bureaucracy. And what follows immediately after this is the stand at Mount Sinai. Only once Moses has learned this lesson from Yitro, to be a part of the people, to have the structure of the people there, can he ascend the mountain without fear of getting disconnected and running away and being a loner? Avraham needed to be a loner. Moshe needs to be a part of, a team player, one of many leaders, elders, a structure, a community, not alone. And Moshe will essentially, though lonely, will never be alone, you know, for the rest of his life. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of discussion possible here about kinds of leadership. What kind of leader do we want, do we need? Do we want somebody who's just another one of the guys? Do you want a leader who's like, how much different do they have to be than just one of the people in order for you to see them as, you know, as rabbis, we deal with this all the time. People expect us to not do things that ordinary, regular people do. They don't like to hear their rabbis swear. They don't like us to make really crass jokes, really crude stuff. Nah, like that. We want you to have a little more elevation. They don't want to see you out getting hammered with the guys at the frat house, that kind of thing. No. You don't want that. On the other hand, do you want somebody who is so, in, in Yiddish and German, there's an expression, Luftmensch, right? A, 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 a cloud person who's got their head so much up in the, in the sky, a sky person that, you know, they, they don't know how things work. They, they never been drunk. Right? I mean, do you really, I mean, you want to leave, maybe that's a bad example, you know, but you know what I mean, right? Somebody who's so disconnected that they can't be a part of the community and live amongst. Uh, yeah, Barbara, and then. Cindy. I think it's not only religious leaders, we do that in our secular leaders also, because we tend to feel they can't relate to us if they're too far removed. That is different how we feel about the rabbi or the minister, 
particularly with their wife and kids. They're always critical of the wife and kids who didn't necessarily choose this rabbinical role. Um, you know, she's wearing this and that's terrible. Or the kids right. didn't uh, do X and that's terrible. So we're kind of hypocritical about it as far as the rabbi yes, and his family goes. I, I agree. It's, um, it's the, be I, uh, Barbara, what I call that is the beer and milk right, in politics. Um, everybody is like, it, in American politics, it's who do you want to have a beer with? As if that mattered, right? But it's, in other words, it's a personal appeal. Are they one of the guys? But then none of them know the price of milk, right? So like, we, we have this expectation of them that they're one of the guys, and yet none of them are one of the guys, turns out, right? Yeah, Cindy. Well, I think that um, that these two leadership styles that we witnessed in the text maybe shows us the balance that's needed in successful leadership with the with a leader being somewhat separated to lead by example and to elevate the community. But on the other hand, to also lead from the bottom up, to be in touch with the, the ideas of those that that person is leading. And, um, and I, I heard an, an, an interesting um, story recently that might illustrate that, um, the, the, um, I think he's the chairman of Morgan Stanley. They, they bought the E-Trade as a subsidiary and there was a Zoom meeting when, the, when, they, when they got together and, um, and James Gorman is sitting there in his coat and tie in the Zoom meeting and the, and the, you know, the, the cool brokers from E-Trade are like, you know, what are you gonna do about dress policy? And he says, we're gonna be flexible. And he stands up on the top, he's got a suit and tie and on the bottom, he's got a pair of jeans. So somebody who is well respected and it is ethical and menschlich, you know, menschlich, whatever the word is, and yet is still in touch with those that, that he is leading, in my opinion, is a successful leader. And I think that we see that with the, these two models that we just studied, that if we can combine the two rather than it being black and white. I am, um, you know, books could be written about clergy and clothing and, um, uh, and about their families and about the differences in expectation between men and women clergy. I mean, books could be written about this stuff. And my own experience is that um, uh, I've found that it's important to be casual, even though there are people who it gets under their craw that you don't have a tie on like there's no tomorrow. And I think like those people, there are times I'll put on a tie, but if what you're looking for is a tie, you, you have misplaced ideas. And I can't, um, uh, you know, I just, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, please. Well, I think it depends on the circumstances, the people that you're leading, some people need to have a leader that they can put up here. And then some circumstances need the people you're leading to be almost your equal because everybody has a responsibility. Right. So it's, I, I don't think we can generalize. Um, no, and I, mean, um, I agree there needs to be a balance. But right, I think, I, yeah, I think that's part of Klitzner's point was that Avraham required one thing because right. his time and people called for it. Moshe requires something else because his time and people require for it. When I was interviewing at Sherith Israel in Atlanta, the larger conservative synagogue, Ahavat Achim, AA, was also looking for a rabbi. And um, people were like, when they found out I was um, uh, interested in going to Atlanta, they're like, oh, are you interviewing at AA? Because that was the much more prestigious, larger, you know, better position, as it were. Are you interviewing at AA? I was like, no way. The, you know, I was like, those guys have to wear ties to morning minion. And then like, they, they have to wear, there's like what color suit you can wear, not just that you have to wear a suit, um, you know, and uh, so I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not, you know, because you're right, because that place and that culture and that time 
um, called for that. And that was the expectation. And, and I believe even their very um, you know, game changer rabbi who's there now, after the previous guy who was there for 10 years um, and wore a tie at Daily Minion still wears a tie every day because that is the culture of the place. And in that place, they expect and want their leader to have that. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing. I agree. Um, but you described the need for flexibility and as, as did Cindy's story. And I think that many of us find that in our own lives and how we relate to people or relate to us around us. There are some people that you treat or that you dress up for, and there are others where, you know, maybe on a one-to-one -one basis, you certainly don't need to. Uh, I don't wear a tie in my job. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's very different when you're born into that position. Now, these two people aren't really born into that position. Although if you think of, you know, their circumstances, their relationships to God, but royalty, uh, the expectations are totally different. So now we have the resigned princess of Japan and, and things like that because royal or or even prince harry you don't ex royalty is not allowed to have the flexibility and um maybe that's why maybe that's why there are some people still in the united states who treat presidents as royalty and i'm sure a lot of us remember the aggravation that um, Obama got for wearing a tan suit. I mean, it's, uh, I thought, it was, thought this is the exact same story because yeah. who didn't at the time, everybody had a tan suit. That was perfectly normal. That wasn't like he was wearing, you know, some lollipop, you know, weirdo thing. Right. This was like, who didn't have a tan suit? Right. Like, so, um, <laughs> Alan is saying you didn't have a tan suit. <laughs> you, did, you did have a tan suit. But today, yeah. you'd never go for a job interview in a tan suit. No, I mean, no uh, you would. You, well, you would find out what was the culture of the place, and you would you would yeah. play to the culture of the place if you wanted the job, or you would be willing to put dress on the discussion. Yeah, right. It would become a point of deliberation in, in, in it. Um, I, um, yeah, that expect, look, um, when I was, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share the, again, a little personal thing. Um, when I was in New York as a rabbi, I was single and, um, I used to joke, um, uh, I had been married and so I was divorced and single, and I, I wasn't really interested in, in dating and meeting somebody when I was the rabbi of a place that was mostly single people. So there were a lot of single people in my congregation, and I had a rule, you know, like, which is a good rule, which is, you know, you, you don't eat where you sleep. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, like, you know, there's, there's a hundred thousand single Jews in New York. I don't need to date the few hundred that are in my congregation. Um, and people would say, older folks would say, can I set you up? And I would say, don't set me up. Like, I don't want that. I'm not interested. And you don't want that either. Because I used to say, uh, the rabbi can date somebody from the congregation, but they can't ever break up with them. <laughs> you can date one person, right? But see, a regular person, if I was a civilian, then I could just walk around and I could over years date as many people as i wanted and none of my friends would have looked at it as like unusual they're like no Hillel's single he's alive he's in new york city you know what do we care if he goes out with one person for three months and another person for three months and somebody else for three months hey he was married and divorced you know like give whatever he'll find somebody we find somebody nope not anymore can't do it um when i was dating joanna I would not let her come to synagogue. That, that, that's literally true. I was like, you may not come because this is meaningful. I, we knew right away that it was meaningful. And I was like, no, I, I do not want this as a part of there. This I'm going to keep this over here separate and that kind of thing because the scrutiny, the expectations, et cetera, et cetera. I just didn't want any of that. Yeah. So um, 
there are, you know, imagine if you're, if your rabbi dated six or seven different people in the course of whatever, and, and you knew that, you know, more than one or two of them had spent the night at their house. <laughs> How, you know, if that were your friend, you'd be totally cool with that. What do you care? Right? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't be totally cool with that. I would be totally cool with that. I'd be totally cool with my rabbi friends. It's none of my business. It's none of my business. I'd be totally cool with my rabbi friends, but most I'm people not know. there, Rabbi. <laughs> I'm sorry you that that you yes. So so your life and a leader's life, yes, are under more of a microscope. Um, but but I but I do believe that um, that living in community. Um, put, puts all of us under a microscope and holds all of us to a higher standard. And, um, and, and I, I think that, that it's an issue with community as much as it's an issue with, with leadership. Um, so, so it's easier to um, have independent an independent ethic if you separate yourself from a community. And it's part of why we as Jews don't encourage people to separate from community right. so that you don't have a totally separate ethic. You're always responsible to someone. And I mean, I'm sitting here laughing because I mean, you bring up the whole dating thing and-, um, I, and did, I, I, did I chase some people away maybe? No, I, I guess I <laughs> know it's the hour is late, but, um, but the discussion is great. So I, I do, I, my husband and I do have a friend who is a widower and he, um, he hasn't started dating yet, but the, all of us are like, I have our eyes on him, make sure that he's okay and that he's not alone, this, that, and the other thing. And as soon as he talks to a, to a, an eligible woman, we're all talking to him. Who are you talking to him? Why are you talking to her? Are you sure she's the right one for you? So you can say what you want. And so he met somebody for coffee today and he called me. He says, I just want you to know I met someone for coffee because somebody's probably going to call you and tell you before I don't want it. You. So, you know, we, we are part of a community. We all care about each other. And we do, um, yes, we do hold our leaders to a very high standard because our community needs that, 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 that leadership, that moral leadership, that ethical leadership, um, the enforcement. Will, will, you say, try, will you say more about that? Um, like, with the, I, because I agree, I think a community does need that. It, what is it about somehow being in a balanced way, but somehow being separate or diff, you know, not better or some, I, 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 I don't know what the right word is, but like somehow separated from empowers you to do what you're describing the community needs. Wait, are you talking about a leader or an individual in community? No, yeah, a leader, a leader. Okay, so a, a leader ha has to be somewhat separate, in my opinion, to have like an, o like a, like an overview, okay? So as a member of our community, perhaps, you know, our, we, we, we have blinders. We only see our part of the community. Okay, a leader has to has has to have a broader view mm -hmm. as protecting the community, as protecting people from themselves, right. um, and as being you know. And I guess it's like being a, being a conscience of the community um, to direct the community in the right way. So there there is a little bit of separation, I, I would argue, but I but I do also like the fact that. Um, that the leader be a part of the community. Um, like, I like the fact that you don't wear a tie, okay? But I do find it important, even though we are maybe peers age-wise, or I might even be older than you, I will always call you rabbi. Right. But we've had younger rabbis, and I've always called them rabbi. That's my Michigas. Okay, because I need that person of authority 
to be a little bit separate from me. Yeah, I don't think it's Michigas. I don't at all. I think it comes down to a certain level of respect that is appropriate to this person who is perhaps not, they haven't always been my personal leader, but as Cindy's right, they have been the leader of the community and I am more respectful of them if they also play a certain part of that role. So um, there is a role that your job automatically, you know, your rabbinical job gives you, that's a role that it, in a certain sense you have to play. And we have expectations, but to allow you to be um, flexible with your position, that's a kind of what does this situation demand role. And I think that wearing the tie or not wearing the tie is only part of that. But I want to be able to respect the decisions you make, the statements you make, you know, the rabbi makes, um, the knowledge you can provide. Some of it, um, I think, comes down to do, does it seem like the leader is self aware that they know and have are, are thoughtful about what they're doing, or are they um, are they being driven by, you know, whatever, you know, whatever not so good motivations. I, I call the ta my Taekwondo master, master. I mean, he's my friend. He lives down the street from me. You know, we are peers. He's a couple years younger than me. Um, we're good friends, but I don't call him Kurt. <laughs> you know, because it is also, I'm, I'm building and rec, it's, a, it's my perspective. It's, he has a perspective. He doesn't tell me to call him Curtis. He expects me to call him master. And because he knows that he has something to impart and I know that he has something to impart. He has something that I don't have. That's okay, it doesn't make him better than me, but it does make him master mast and makes me Rabbi Nori. Yeah. Or doctor or father, you know, I mean, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be title. It can be, you know, without that kind of, language, but yeah, Ella. Um, I recall when I was on one of those Zoom calls where we were deciding, or people were expressing what they wanted in a rabbi, and you were there and you, you asked me, do you, uh, can the rabbi drive on Shabbat? Right. And I was a little surprised at that because I really feel that in a conservative synagogue, that is his or her personal choice. And but get on the Bema and I kind of expect them to follow certain protocols, you know, um, right. uh, that kind of thing. But I was surprised that as a leader, people were took an issue. Yes, we don't or no, we don't want him to drive on Shabbat or yes, we do want her to drive on. You know, it's OK, right. you know, and it, it became quite a discussion. Well, there were, if, if I recall, in maybe it wasn't that particular discussion, there were, there were some people who thought, you can't be the rabbi here if you don't drive, because uh, you, you got to be a part of the people and you got to be able to go to their homes and they got to be able to come to you and, you know, like things are going to happen, you're going to have to be there. And there were other people who felt like, you know, if, if they drive on Shabbat, how are they any different than anybody else or or maybe we'll be limiting ourselves if we only re if we require someone to drive. Maybe there's someone who wouldn't drive who would be a better rabbi for us, and we'll narrow our you know our our funnel. Um, so yeah, I think it was a very lively discussion. I think it's emblematic of this kind of discussion of you know a part of or apart from part of part balance. It's flexibility. All right. I'm sorry to leave. This has been great. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, thank, you. All thank of you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank this you. Was really good. Thank you very much. As you can tell, I'm here. I'm here. So I'm here this weekend. Come to show. Have a good holiday. We don't. Thanks. Play.